Dr. Wood. Could you tell us a bit about yourself and your work? Yeah. Uh, let's see. I've been uh, teaching at Ozark Christian College for, man, it's, I think I'm coming into my 15th year. Uh, I've done my uh, PhD work is in Revelation at the University of Edinburgh, I'm specifically asking the question of how the book of Revelation interacts with the Roman Empire. But um, uh, mo most of my um, graduate work has been in the field of eschatology or Revelation. Um, even my publications, although at times I like to uh, wrestle more with some of the spiritual formation aspects as well. But uh, Revelation's my jam that I get to travel and speak on and write on. And yeah, does that answer your question? I don't know if that. <laughs> no. Can you tell us? A... <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about your work at Edinburgh? Like, what did you work on? Have you published? Yeah. What are those sorts of subjects that you publish on? Yeah, so I got to to study under Helen Bond, uh, who she's uh, much more well known for her areas of a historical Jesus, but you know, world's leading expert in Caiaphas and Pontius Pilate. Um, and I was able to intentionally study under her on the Book of Revelation because I wanted somebody uh, as an expert in the field of where the world of the Roman Empire and the biblical text collide. Um, and so under her guidance, I dove into post-colonial theory and examinations of dominance, how subjects and sovereigns interact, um, knowing that, you know, the biblical text is a subject text. Um, and so at times there's going to be interactions with the sovereigns of, of uh, from a subject perspective, both positive, negative, and at times indifferent. Um, and I was asking specifically, how does the imagery of Revelation uh, highlight or communicate this interaction between the subjects and the sovereigns? Um, and I specifically um, focused on, um, uh, so I, it, the book uh, that was published out of that, it's called The Alter Imperial Paradigm, Empire Studies in the Book of Revelation. Um, and I developed a paradigm of saying, I don't know that we're really looking at empire questions critically enough. Uh, we always just assume anti-imperial, but frankly, subjects are far more complex than just a for or against an empire. Um, and Revelation's imagery displays that, uh, specifically in the release of Satan. Um, I make the argument that the release of Satan actually can be explained best with imagery from a Roman triumphal procession. So, uh, But the, the idea was to develop a paradigm that we can extrapolate not just to the rest of Revelation, but maybe even to Pauline studies and, and gospel studies, too, that um, have imperial questions. That's awesome. But today we're going to focus on a little bit of a different subject. We're going to talk a little bit about everyone's favorite topic, the rapture. <laughs> we're going to yeah. reduce all of your exciting research to this one popular topic. Uh... <laughs> well, I think it was in one of your classes that I first heard that something like the majority of the, the questions that pastors will get will either be mm -hmm. from like Genesis or Revelation, the beginning mm -hmm. and the end. I believe there was something that you said about that. And that makes sense because now having been in ministry a little bit, that is a hundred percent true. <laughs> it is. It's it. And, and it's, it's normal, you know, for humans to wrestle with their origins and where they're, they're, they're tell us where they're headed. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're preparing for ministry and you, you uh, actually haven't dove into anything revelation, get ready to live. Uh, because if you ask your congregation top 10 questions, you know, four or 40 percent of them, 50 percent of them will be related to the end of everything. Uh, but like I said, I think that's innate in who we are as humans. I don't I don't lament that and I don't even um, uh, fight that. I think it's actually normal for us to know where we're or the desire to know uh, where we are headed. And just in case there's like, you know, three people who don't know what it is, can you tell us a little bit about what the rapture actually is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the rapture is the belief or the teaching. Uh, and and there, there are nuances and derivations, just like any sort of theory, you can find different flavors. Uh, but the general belief that uh, either before or in the middle of a time period of intense persecution or suffering, the church will be pulled out of the earth, will be removed from the earth to a safe, secure space in the sky by and by before uh, this millennial kingdom reign where there is this peace on earth, where Christ is reigning before a, what, I don't know, second coming part two or a third coming, however many you want to count, that ends the millennial reign a thousand years and uh, ushers us into eternity. So the rapture is this like, um, in a sense, almost seemed to, seen as this like uh, gift 
to the faithful, of removing them before things get bad or as things are bad, um, as a way of, um, in a sense, rewarding their faithfulness. I don't really know how else to, to measure the way in which people are raptured outside of that concept of, of rewarding faithfulness. Sometimes it's like a secret rapture, a silent rapture, although that's kind of hard to defend whenever you have a lot of trumpets blasting and stuff like that. But sneak attack. Sneak attack. Uh, well, did, did you grow up believing in the rapture? Is this is this what you come from, your background? My background, I grew up in a church that did not talk about Revelation. Uh, it was like, I remember as a, as a four-year-old, you know, uh, we would, I, I grew up at a non-instrumental church of Christ. So I know that maybe some of your listeners have no idea what that's like. The way I describe it is in my church, all church of Christ and Christian church, because they're independent, they all have very different flavors. And so, because they're autonomous, my flavor, our church of Christ believed that no one outside of us is saved. And we're not even really sure if we are half the time. So it, it was this very different way of processing our identity. Um, and Revelation, like as a four-year-old, I had to memorize my books of the Bible. So I knew the book of Revelation, but we didn't preach on it. We didn't teach on it. But what I heard about it echoing through the halls of the church uh, was that, yeah, that this idea that we will be pulled out at a certain point before things get bad. So you better not be left behind. But that was, I, I picked it up. I just don't remember ever being officially taught it. Uh, but when I did go to investigate it, that was everything that everybody talked about that I ended up talking to. Now, we were talking a little bit before we started the recording about a little bit of a humorous story that you had with regards <laughs> to end of days. Can you, <laughs> yeah. can you share that with our listeners? And have you heard any other stories like this? Hilarious stories about beliefs about the end times that happened? Yeah, you know, so my very first interaction with Book of Revelation, because I grew up in a church that didn't talk about it. Um, I'm a junior in high school. I'm coming home. It's after curfew. Um, I was one of those kids that, man, I just, sometimes I'd be in the moment at a friend's house and I'm like, eh, it's worth getting grounded next weekend. And I would stay too long, but then I would try to rush home to make it up for it. So I'm rushing home. I have this little Geo Metro. So you're talking like, it's like a little Skittle. It's like a, like a, a micro machine. Uh, and I'm, I'm going down 4061 in the St. Louis area. And I come up over this hill and I am Square in the face, blood red moon. Now I'm a I'm kind of a suburban boy, so I I didn't totally know this was a natural phenomenon, like a harvest moon that this happened pretty consistently. But for me, it was like, oh my gosh, the world's going to end, and there's so much I haven't experienced. So I went home, and I the only thing I knew to do is to grab my Bible and turn to the crispest pages in the book, which was Revelation, because we didn't touch it. And I read Revelation at 1.30 in the morning. I read it from, from beginning to end, all 404 verses. And I remember putting down my Bible and seeing the little green uh, you know, LED lights on our VCR that said 3.18 in the morning. And I was scared out of my freaking mind. <laughs> and that was my first interaction with Revelation. Can I tell you a, a bit of a humorous story that I may or may not keep in this episode? Sure. So when I was a little kid, we were watching the the real Left Behind series, the James Cameron, not the Nicolas Cage one, the oh, real yes. Left Behind series. True. Kirk Cameron. And, Kirk, that's true. Would have been it's a, Kirk. a very different movie if James Cameron had James done it. Cameron. Yeah, that's right. Avatar James it. Cameron. <laughs> Avatar. Yeah. High God. budget. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The billion dollar epic Left Behind. Kirk Cameron, excuse me. So I'm listening to Kirk Cameron and Left Behind. <laughs> I'm watching it. My my mom's got it on. And boy, was it terrifying, especially when mm -hmm. the Antichrist was being talked about and how he like came from like a good Christian family. And like they're talking about like all these descriptions about the Antichrist. And I'm sitting there going, you know who that sounds like? Me. <laughs> what? You were Me. throwing your hat into the ring for the Antichrist role? <laughs> Well, yeah, and I'm just sitting there like sweating bullets, you <laughs> know, as a little awesome. kid. And I, I look at my mom and I said, Mom, could I be the Antichrist? Could I get possessed by Satan? Mm -hmm. And she looked at me dead honest, looked me right in the face and said, you could. <laughs> I never had a more sleepless night looking at my closet, just waiting for the spirit of Satan to jump out and, ah, 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 and jump uh -oh. on me and, you know possessed me and I became the Antichrist, you know? So, so. That, that was the moment you knew who you were called to be. Well, no, and, I and told that, this, 
And I told this once. This is the origin story. This is I, the origin. I told this story once, and then one of my professors in the midst of this goes, well, you know, the jury's still out on that, Seth. So. <laughs> Here's what's interesting, though, about your story. First of all, it is humorous, but there is an element of, of, of the story that you told that I commonly do hear, and that's terror. Um, whenever you speak of rapture, a lot of the times the, the, the follow-up comment is, yeah, whenever I was a kid, it terrified me to think I could be left behind. I mean, I, you're the first person I've ever heard that was terrified about potentially being the Antichrist. But but it is. It, it is a doctrine that is rooted in a pretty con, consistent fear, um, a, a fear of not just being left behind, but a, a, a fear of what is the particular point in which I fall from being in to being out. Um, you know, it's it's th there's a reason why I mentioned growing up in my churches that we believed no one outside of us was saved, and we really weren't sure if we were moment to moment. I mean, it was it was a fear-based setting. Most legalistic settings are fear-based. And whenever fear is the driving point of a doctrine, I think there's a moment we have to stop and, and ask ourselves the question, is this actually matching what it is the text is driving us to? Um, so I, I was just telling my students the other day that I believe Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 through 18 summarizes not only the entire book of Revelation, but the gospel is that John experiences Christ on Patmos. He falls down as though dead. And then it says, and Christ reached out and touched him. And the first words that Christ says is, do not be afraid. So, so one of my initial impulses of even pushing back against the rapture theology is to say, um, if our theology is rooted in, or even is ultimately wielding the weapon of fear more than the love that casts out all fear, uh, we, we need to, at the very least, raise a red flag and just say, are we sure we're moving in the trajectory of God's character that he's revealed to us through Christ on the cross? It, it doesn't mean we're not. It just means we should at least use that as a guardrail. So this sort of, sorry, go ahead, Seth. So this sort of uh, culture of fear um, and sort of this sense that the rapture is coming at any moment, is is this something new? Or has the church kind of always had this worldview? Is this going all the way back over 2,000 years, the consistent sort of belief? Mm -hmm. So if we're talking about, I'm going to split it into two things. Uh, if we're talking about the uh, belief that, that, that an unexpected something could happen where Christ comes back, uh, that goes all the way back to first century. You know, thief in the night is the number one gospel, Pauline, and revelation metaphor for Christ's second coming, a thief. And the key thing about the thief metaphor is you can't predict a thief. It can happen at any moment. So the, so the impulse of that is, therefore, always be ready. But if we're talking about the specific teaching of the rapture, no, that does not go back to the first century. That actually is, is quite recent in church history. And this is, uh, whenever people ask me what I think of the rapture, I usually always say, uh, I'm going to give you my answer. I'll give you five seconds to throw your tomatoes, and then I'll give you the two reasons why I am where I am today. Uh, because, and I say it that way because I'm also still in process. I'm always open to being wrong. Um, you know, I tell my students all the time, "You're allowed to disagree with me and get an A. Uh, it's okay if if you disagree with us." Although a lot of the times when I'm talking to people about the rapture, they don't agree with that. Uh, rapture becomes this litmus test of who really is a Christian, and I find that to be lamentable. Um, however. Uh, no, the first reason why I have a red flag of the rapture is that the first time the concept of the church being pulled out, either right before a time period of persecution or during, was in 1830. A woman by the name of Margaret MacDonald put herself into a self-induced fever so she could have a prophetic trance. And she wrote down what she experienced. And in, and in the letter, the church is pulled out. Uh, right before, I actually have a, a copy of the letter uh, over there in, uh, on that bookshelf. I mean, when you read it, it's it actually is. It's this it's this fascinating. Now there is some theological issues with some of the stuff that she says outside of it, but it is it's the first time that we have recorded of anybody teaching in the first eighteen hundred years of the church the idea of a rapture. Um, a guy by the name of John Nelson Darby. So you're talking eighteen thirty. This is all over in the UK, which is actually pretty funny. I remember. Uh, you know, doing my PhD in the UK was hilarious because I'm in the British New Testament conference. I'm sitting around this, this table with a bunch of Revelation scholars, and they were confused. They're like, 
American churches really believe in this idea of the rapture? And finally, I was like, excuse me, y'all gave it to us. So I don't want to hear <laughs> any sort of criticism. It came from y'all. <laughs> uh, but John Nelson Darby uh, then puts the theological muscle uh, around this vision of Margaret McDonald. Whether or not they had contact or anything of that nature is is a big question mark. But we do know they're in the same location that they do know of each other eventually, and that John Nelson Darby takes this idea, and he has, over the next 15 to 20 years, six trips to America, um, influencing a group primarily known as the uh, the Plymouth Brethren. And he is espousing this rapture belief that then eventually influences a guy by the name of Cyrus Schofield, who wrote the first study Bible. He c compiled the first study Bible, the Schofield Reference Bible. Uh, that now we take for granted. You know, we have our Zondervan study Bibles and our ESV study Bibles and um, all kinds of this. Well, Schofield was the first one to do that in English, and it was a wildly bestseller, 1907 to 1914. Um, and that the problem is, is people stop distinguishing the inspired words at the top and the uninspired words at the bottom. But the uninspired words was espousing this rapture belief um, that influences a guy by the name of uh, Dwight L. Moody who, um, from my belief, he was the greatest evangelist in the first half of the 20th century. Um, the church that my family and I attended whenever I lived in Scotland uh, was a church established by Dwight L. Moody. Like the guy was an evangelist second to none. But whenever he went and took the message of Jesus, he also took the message of the rapture. And that influences a lot of people. Just like the next uh, greatest evangelist of the 20th century, uh, Billy Graham who in the 1970s wrote a book called Approaching Hoofbeats, which espouses the rapture theology. Around the same time in the 1970s, a guy by the name of uh, uh, Hal Lindsey wrote the book The Late Great Planet Earth that worldwide in the decade of the 70s outsold the Bible, and it espoused a rapture theology. Then you have in 1988, the book by Edgar Wisenot called, well, it's not really a book, it's more of a pamphlet, but pretty influential, 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Happen in 1988 followed up by the riveting 89 reasons why the rapture will happen in 1989. And then in 1990, Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins write the uh, Left Behind series, the first out of 13 volumes that ended up developing into prequels. But the first volume sold over 80 million copies worldwide. And that's how in 190 years, what had never been talked about in the history of the church becomes not just a popular view, but in, frankly, a lot of evangelical minds, the dominant view of how revelation in the world is going to end. Basically, I'll be honest with you, um, rapture has good marketing. I mean, it's easy to sell that before things get really bad, you're going to get taken out. It's really hard to sell something more along the lines of John 17, 15, which says, my prayer is not that they're taken out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one as they experience suffering. <laughs> that doesn't sell. So what you're saying is the rapture is more recent historically than the than Frankenstein, the book. <laughs> like this is a recent, yeah. deeply recent thing that yep. ha doesn't have roots back in church history. That's yeah. Now yes, that's correct. And I I don't think it's incidental also that it is um it is arising at the time also where there's a lot of optimism and as there's this colonizing expansion. Um, so as things are getting more positive, if things get negative, then there's also this handout of a sense of you're going to get pulled out before it gets really bad. Um, but yeah, you're, 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 I would, that is a correct assessment. The rapture. Now I'm being, being very specific. I'm not talking about the concept of a thousand year reign on earth that goes back. You can trace that back to the earliest strata of, of Christian history, but the concept of a rapture in like a tribulation, seven year tribulation. That's about 190 years old. My favorite part about your story is when these British scholars were making fun of Americans. You didn't say you gave it to us. You said y'all gave it to <laughs> us. The most American way you could have ever phrased that. You're darn right. You know, I, as a Canadian, I often lament Americans and the existence of America. And then I realize it's England's fault. That you guys are all, they came from England. So I, I too blame England for all of this, this whole, this whole debacle. It's that's, England's fault now, eh? I love it. So if this is a recent phenomenon, mm -hmm. something that's less than 200 years old, like we can trace some pretty modern heresies back further than that. Yep. 
what sort of biblical text were they appealing to? What was Darby going to in the Bible, apparently finding that 90% of church history somehow missed? Yeah, and I and I do want to make sure that I that I say this. Just because it's 190 years old doesn't mean it's wrong. It's just a red flag. It makes you stop and go, hmm. Uh, and and, and I, I want to be specific on that because there is a part of this where we're, we, I actually, and I know this is not very Protestant of me, uh, but I do believe that, that we're dealing with an infinite God and therefore it shouldn't surprise us when at times we're able to uncover something that at one point we just did not cle- see clearly. So because of its recent, I don't want to have a recency bias to say because it's recent church history, therefore it must be false. So that's why I always say there's two reasons why I eventually come to the conclusion I, I don't believe in a rapture. One is history gives me pause. That makes me stop and go, that's pretty new. I need to dive into the second reason, and that's the texts. And so that's what you're guiding towards. There are three major texts, although just like everything, uh, whenever you put the lens on, you can find it everywhere. Uh, But there are three big ones when it comes to the rapture. Um, And I'll say them in canonical order uh, for no other reason than that's easier. Uh, But Matthew chapter 24, verses 40 through 41, uh, that's the big one. That's the one, the image that everybody gets. You know, two will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two will be at the hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Um, that's a big one. First uh, Thessalonians chapter four, verses 13 through 18. That's the idea of, and then they will meet him, Christ, in the air. So that's actually where the word rapture even comes from. Uh, the word rapture in English does not appear in the Bible a single time. Uh, but in the Latin translation of First Thessalonians four, it uses the word, the root word from where we get the word rapture. And so the idea of the rapture comes from 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. And the other one's Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. Uh, and I remember reading M.R. Dahan has this quote that, that startles me. Um, he's a, he's, he espouses the rapture position. And he's talking about Revelation 4, verse 1, which is, you know, John is on Patmos. And then, you know, Revelation 2 through 3, you get the letters to the seven churches. And then in chapter 4, it begins, this voice from heaven, from the throne, says, come up here. Stop talking to John, come up here. And then John goes up there and he sees, you know, the four living creatures crying out day and night, you know, holy, holy, holy. And he gets to see this amazing throne room scene. Well, the come up here is what is the rapture passage of Revelation 4.1. And M.R. Dahan says the rapture in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 is the clearest picture of the rapture in the Bible. And I remember when I read it out loud, I said, that's my problem. If that's the clearest uh, picture of the rapture in the Bible, we have an issue because I have to ignore pronouns. You know, I, John, was told to come up here. You come up like none of that matters. And I've had people I had somebody I was doing a QA and a recently on on end times and rapture got brought up. And then the, you know, the lady was like, well, but, you know, in Revelation, after chapter after it says that the word church never appears in the book of Revelation. I said, well, yeah, that is true. I said, but two things to that. Number one, the number one name for Christians in Revelation is holy ones. We translate it saints, and that's used all the time. I said, number two, just because Paul doesn't say Timothy's name every chapter doesn't mean that in chapter four of First Timothy, he starts talking to somebody else. <laughs> like, I mean, Jesus is pretty clear in the first three chapters who this is written to. I don't know why he doesn't have to, I don't know why he has to keep naming them in order for them to still be the audience. Um, those are the three big ones. My, I have significant issues with each of those. I think Revelation four one I've cleared up. Do you do you want me to go into the other ones, or do you? Do, is that would that be helpful? Or yeah, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, so Matthew twenty four is the one I'll start with first because that one that one is the big image. You know, that's the uh, for, verse forty twenty four forty. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken. The other left. Two women will be grinding with the hand mill. One will be taken, and the other left. You know, the, the idea of someone is taken away, somebody is left. And then the conclusion is, don't be left behind. The problem is context. You know, this is something that we teach at, at my school here all the time. Um, if, you know, whenever you're reading a verse, don't pull it out of context. Just read at least four verses before, four verses after. It'll at least give you a, a running start. And in this case, it's, it's kind of damning for this position. Um, so if you go back to verse 36. But about that day or hour, Jesus is talking about the second coming here. No one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. That's usually whenever I'm teaching this at a church, I always pause here and I say, so can we please stop predicting? (laughs) 
because we're not going to, if Jesus doesn't know when he's coming back, you're probably not going to crack the code. And I've actually had people say to me, well, he says we can't know the day or the hour, but we can know the month or the year. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, you honestly think that's what his point was? I want you to guess the month or the year, just not the day or the hour. Like, no, his point is, don't. You're wasting kingdom energy whenever you're using your time predicting things like eclipses pointing towards the second coming or blood red moons. No one knows. So what's the implication? Be stinking ready. Always be ready. But verse 37, it says, as it was in the days of Noah. So Jesus, like a good preacher, is bringing in an illustration. He's like, let me explain the second coming thing. As it was in the days of Noah, so Genesis 6, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. And then he uses the illustration. And what I always try to point out here is that the singular and the plural matter. He's delineating two groups, good and evil, based off of singular and plural. Uh, For in the days before the flood, people, plural. So he's already used Noah, singular, people, plural. We're giving, we're eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah, singular, entered the ark. So now we have these two groups. And the question that you, that you need to you know, ask from Genesis 6 is, if Noah is the singular and the people or you know, uh, outside of the ark are the plural, which is good and which is evil? Well, clearly Noah and his family, the singular in this text is good. And the plural in this text, the people outside of the ark are evil. So this is what Jesus is saying. This is what we have the second coming. Then he says this, verse 39, and they, plural, knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and swept them, plural, all the way. So using Jesus' illustration, I say, well, then in the days of Noah, who was swept away? Who was taken away from the earth? The answer was plural, the evil. Then the very next phrase, he says, that is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. According to the days of Noah, though, the person that's left is good, not the evil. So my pushback on this text is you have the wrong people being left behind. In the text, like in the days of Noah, the new creation was given to the good, to Noah and his family. But the evil is swept away. So, so my, my big pushback on this text is, according to this text, I want to be left behind. <laughs> and that creates a problem for the entire position. Because now we have the wrong people leaving. Because I believe that what you know, the eschaton, eschatology teaches is that we're still going to use this place. It's, still, it's just going to be the earth experienced without the curse, the curse in reverse, a purified existence, kind of like um, we are a new creation in Christ because in Christ, sin is being purged from us, like a, like a Roman 6. We're putting to death sin. Uh, well, the same thing will happen to all of the cosmos, the cosmos that is subjected to the bondage of decay that it is groaning and longing for the sons and daughters of God to be revealed so that it can experience the liberation that we get to experience through the Spirit right now. That is where we're headed, uh, which is why the word specifically used in Second Peter 3, as well as in Revelation 21 for new, is kainos, new like a newly restored 57 Chevy. Not like brand new, I wiped out because Satan did something Christ couldn't undo, so we had to just scrap this whole thing and start over. No, what Satan accomplished in Genesis 3 was not as powerful as what Christ accomplished at the cross. We're still going to use this place. Therefore, we want to be left behind. Because like in the days of Noah, the new creation will be something we get to experience. Is that making sense? Like what I'm... That's 100% making sense. I love that. Do you have, just real quickly before, we probably need to switch topics. No, you're great. Do you have like one or two verses that someone's like, well, are there verses that suggest that there isn't a rapture or a seven year tribulation? <laughs> something that you're, you're go. I know we don't like proof texts, but is oh, there absolutely. something like that? No, absolutely. Well, first of all, I always try to point out like the word seven year tribulation never appears in the entire Bible. <laughs> like that's actually a, a, a leftover of the 77s of Daniel chapter nine, that then we smuggle out because we say that last seven hasn't happened and we catapult it is the most past, you know, uh, the stitched together theological system that I that I think actually exists because we're literally pulling little crumbs from here and there and and pulling together. And like I tell students, like if you read anything, um, if you come to 
if you ask the wrong questions, you'll still find answers to your questions. The question is, are you asking the right questions? So if you ask, when's the rapture going to happen? You're going to find an answer in Revelation. But what if Revelation's asking a different question? But I do always point to Revel or to John chapter 17, verse 15. I'm like, it's Jesus's last prayer before he's arrested. And so these words mean something to him. And he specifically says, my prayer is not to take you, uh, is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. And the amount of New Testament testimony that we are not greater than our master, that we will experience suffering as a way of combating and destroying the dragon. You know, they overcame the dragon, Revelation 12, 11, by the blood of the lamb and by the rapture. No, like they overcame the dragon by the blood of the lamb and by the testimony of the saints that would not shrink from death when we live in the shape of the cross. So the whole concept of removing us before a time period of suffering there's not just one passage in the New Testament that's antithetical to. That's antithetical to the message of the cross. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't know if your audience, if I should say this or not, but we're, you know, we're recording this during Holy Week, and I'm very cognizant of the fact that what's going to happen in the next couple of days is not something that was just for Jesus and to deal with our get out of hell problem. It's it's an actual ethic He's calling us to live as we experience all kinds of tribulations, regardless of what setting or what time period that we're in. So, no, 1715, Jesus could have said, God, I can't wait till the rapture. Instead, he says, I'm not praying that they leave. I'm praying that you give them a stronger back to endure the onslaught of the enemy. Well, thank you for that really helpful biblical analysis and survey. Um, moving a bit away from the rapture and more into your work in Revelation in general, <laughs> there are many ways to interpret Revelation. Uh, yet your work suggests it mostly isn't actually talking about some future events. Is that a common view? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the answer to that would be yes. It just depends upon which which um, theological tradition that you pay attention to. Uh, that's one of the things I find fascinating is that um, whenever I had I had an 84 year old man whenever I was doing a Q and A at, at um, up in a church in Kansas City. He raised his hand and he said, you know, he said, I, I'm finding what you're talking about with Revelation pretty compelling. We'd even talked about the rapture and stuff like that. He goes, but one of the things you brought about the rapture is that this is really new. And he goes, I've been in the church for over 70 years. And what you're saying seems very new as well. What makes me think I should believe you? And my response was fantastic question. That That's exactly the critical type of thinking that, that is helpful in this conversation. I said, here's the bad news. This has been the dominant view when I'm espousing the dominant view of the church for 2000 years. It's like, this is, this is Irenaeus in the middle of the second century. This is, this is, you know, Victorinus of Petau, whenever he wrote the very first commentary on revelation in the third century. Like this is, this has been what Catholics have believed, <laughs> which I know Protestants freak out every time you say the word Catholics, this is what they believe for 2000 years. So, so, it, it isn't common in a lot of evangelical spheres, but if we're actually more well-versed in the conversations of the church for the last 2,000 years, what I'm saying is pretty run-of-the-mill. It's actually not all that um, novel. Now, what I am, I want to make sure I'm being very clear. What I am not saying is that Revelation doesn't talk about anything in the future. I do believe that it talks about a new heavens and a new earth that is not here now that will come. There is a difference between what I'm saying and like they a what's called a preterist view or a hyper preterist view that everything was fulfilled in 70 AD at the destruction of the temple. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying though, is that revelations target is bigger than prediction. Like all prophecy revelations target was the transformation of the reader because DB Sandy in his book, Plow, uh, plowshares and pruning hook says the prophetic genre's purpose is to prosecute and persuade a rebellious people. That's what revelations goal is. The transformation of the reader, not the prediction or playing some cosmic fortune teller in the sky. So I de-emphasize the future, not because it's completely non-existent revelation, but because that's not the accent on the syllable that revelation is, is, is communicating. Do you think it's kind of harmful, though, that we do consistently have books that come out trying to interpret revelation in light of current events, like trying to find America in revelation? Do you find that to be... Or Canada. Something that's, or Canada. <laughs> For some reason, they're never mentioned. I don't know why, John. It's maybe like they're not as relevant. No. 
yeah. No, I, I actually, I think it's, I think it's uh, beyond damaging uh, for our witness uh, because, because this comes from me with talking with family members that are no longer Christians. Uh, this comes from me even looking at websites of non-Christians that cataloged every single one of the failed predictions of Christ's second coming over the last 250 years. And here's the implied message. If you keep getting the second coming wrong, you're probably getting the first coming wrong too. And my response back is, we're doing it to ourselves. <laughs> when we put so much time and effort trying to predict the future and we consistently prove to be wrong, what makes them think that when we talk about things like atonement, that we're actually speaking truth now? Like how many failed predictions? This is one of the things I always ask. How many failed predictions do, do I get to make before I get my title of prophecy expert ripped away? Because I find that to be astounding. The amount of self-espousing prophecy experts that get prophecy wrong and hurt people, and we still buy their books. At a certain point, we're doing this to ourselves, but it is damaging to our witness of the first coming of Christ because we think we've solved the second coming when in reality, we're swinging and missing so much, people don't even know what we're saying is true and not true half the time. Now, I will say this. I think there's a reason why we want to focus on the future so much. Uh, a lot of the times we obsess over the future in the book of Revelation because we do not want to be confronted about our disobedience in the present. And if we can take this book that is trying to target and prosecute and persuade a rebellious people and punt it to the future, we don't have to deal with the hard work of what we're doing wrong now. And this is actually the reason why I think the church needs revelation now more than ever. Because frankly, a lot of the church's politics today, especially in America, is demonstrating we have forgotten who we are. And revelation's calling you back to that. And the way to hide from that is to just punt it in the future. Let's just predict something instead. Well, a lot of those interpretations you've brought up sound like, you know, they have potentially tragic results. Hmm. So let's pivot a little bit. What are the some of the funniest interpretations of Revelation you've encountered? Oh, man. That's an interesting question. I don't know if I have a uh, fantastic answer. Part of the reason why I think I might struggle with that question more than any question you've asked is that whenever somebody's asking the question, a lot of the times I'm, I'm uh, and more than giggling, I usually am trying to empathize. <laughs> um, our questions usually come from experience. I, I'm very, I, I usually, when people, honestly, a conversation like this, typically uh, I, I, I shy away from, um, not because I don't have answers to the questions that are being asked, but because I know that a lot of times people believe in things like a rapture is connected to their grandma that brought them to church whenever their parents were strung out on drugs and their grandma believed in the rapture. And you're telling me my grandma that died, the only one that fought for me to introduce Jesus was wrong. A lot of the times our questions in the, in the interpretations that are in the room, they're coming from a deep place of, of love and longing. Um, and I have a hard time and, and please don't hear me. I, I know there's funny interpretations and stuff like that. I, I actually, um, I have a hard time hearing any of them as humorous because I believe they're coming from a tender place. Even when we disagree, that's why I constantly say it's okay to disagree with me because you're in process and I'm in process and, and who has shaped me has brought me to the conclusions that I am at knowing that we're all seeking truth, but our truth does come through people. Um, it comes through the people that we love the most. And, and I'm not asking people a lot of the times to deny the rapture. I'm asking them to deny their grandma. And that's a way bigger task. Uh, so yeah, I mean, there's some there's some humorous ways in which we extrapolate some of our interpretations. I always find it funny when every single president <laughs> that is elected is now the Antichrist, and you have a numerical way of proving it. <laughs> I have a catalog of blogs going back to the to the first George Bush of of being able to use the mark of the beast to prove that this one is the Antichrist. I find that funny because I'm just like the Antichrist has literally had so many names, including Seth, that uh. <laughs> That it's hard to catalog. You can go back to Reagan because Ronald Wilson Reagan. Six, 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 six. letters. Six, six, six. Six letters. Absolutely six right. letters. Six letters. Yeah. There we you just go. Didn't have, we just didn't have blogs then. So I can't. I don't have a way of cataloging it. <laughs> I do remember one time I was reading after he was shot in yep. the chest. Yep. And he was put the same and came back. A head wound. 
Yeah, yeah, and came back. He was supposed to have a head wound. So there was like, I, I was reading something at one point where the, the chest was being reinterpreted as the head and how oh, yeah. to get kef- you know, kephale, the Greek word there, to fit. And it, it was actually quite humorous. It's like really yep. trying to get Ronald Reagan to be the Antichrist. Yep. And 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 in that, first of all, it, it, the creativity to come up with these interpretations is is humorous. But but and again, this is just the way my heart works. But beneath that, they believe that there is something at stake that that is so intense that they are willing to dive as deep and to pull together as many threads as they can in order to try to bring God's truth to people. And so I, I love the heart behind the people I don't agree with. I really, I commiserate with it. I'm going like, I have the same heart. We can agree on this. The question then becomes, are we piecing together things that's creating more confusion, terror, fear, or is it illuminating the revelation of Jesus Christ? That's, I just finished writing a, a book on Revelation the other day, and the, the whole first chapter, literally, I just say, we at some point have to take the first five words of the book of Revelation seriously. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. <laughs> like, more than the revelation of when the rapture will happen, it's telling us something about Jesus. And I know that's their heart. Even when they're talking about the Antichrist, they're trying to point to the person that contrasts Christ. And I, I appreciate that. But sometimes, you know... Um, Sometimes our best efforts can create the greatest tragedies, and we need to be cognizant and self-aware enough to know that even if we have good motives, we may be creating more of a mess uh, than we're actually creating a, a solution. Well, thank you for that serious and deeply empathetic answer that makes me feel absolutely Sorry. horrible for having asked that question. No. How, how dare you not descend into the gutter with us, Shane? I mean, geez. Okay. Well, can, I, I'll take credit for that. Part of what motivated us <laughs> wanting to do that is you got an exegetical from a guy named Seth Hart way back in the day, if you don't remember. I don't know if I do. What did you do? Way back in your revelation class, I was auditing it. And so uh-huh. I snuck in a, a fake exegetical. So, I do I couldn't remember get, this. <laughs> Yeah, and I I thought you would notice it, but right before class ended, you start flicking through and you go, "Wait, what is this?" And you yank it out and start reading it in front of the class. What's funny is it probably did sound like a lot of blogs that I read or get sent to me, but it was it was a complete and total parody, and there was yeah. like a cartoon drawing at the end where I drew the Antichrist and stuff with in crown. It was you just amazing. Have to find yeah, it was actually so. phenomenal. <laughs> Best, my proudest accomplishment, you know, it's like N.T. Wright disagrees with me, but he's N.T. wrong, I think was my favorite line I, I pulled from there. That's amazing. Yeah, so that was my that was my parting gift from Ozark at the time, so. And I appreciate it. I don't have it framed, but I do still have it somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Seth's academic career is hilarious. Um, that is true. Well... <laughs> We've talked a lot about what the end times isn't. Mm-hmm. Could you maybe give us a broader overview, like maybe five bullet points or something like mm-hmm. that, of what the end times actually you think are? Like what? Sh- yeah. Like what should we be focusing on? Yeah. So for me, the study of the end times is 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 intended to be a clarifying agent for the call in the present. Um, matter of fact, every single passage in the New Testament. Um, in particular, uh, not because it is in the Old Testament, but I want to stick here more to the second coming of Christ, which is primarily um, uh, spoken of in clear clear terms in the New Testament. Every time it is brought up, though, it is in the context of present living, of ethics. Um, Second Peter 3 is a great example. You know, so they're experiencing these false teachers that are saying, you know, basically this idea of like, oh, you know, you're saying he's coming back again. Well, what's taking him so long? You know, and then and then Peter has this, you know, beautiful response. But like, you know, what they forget is that for God, you know, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. And he's patient because he's longing. His desire is that no one perishes. Like God wa- hopes that hell is empty. Like that's what Second Peter 3 is saying. That's his delay. And then he says, but don't get me wrong. Like th- there's going to be fire that comes and it's going to cure, you know, purify this world and this like, really almost violent picture of purifying. And then he says this, he says, in light of all of this, how then ought we to live? And that, that question that he asks in second Peter three 
in the context of the conflagration of the world, of the end of everything, is the question that is constantly in the background of every eschatological text. In light of this, how then ought we live today? Um, so, for example, in, in Matthew chapter 24, if we kept reading, when Jesus brings up, you know, about that day or hour, Noah knows, and then he talks about the days of Noah. He then ends chapter 24 in through 25 with four parables. And each of the parables has the same twofold message. No one knows. Be ready by what you're doing right now. Always be stinking ready. So Revelation has this, this fascinating Revelation chapter 16, verse 15. So we're, we're in between the sixth and seventh bowl. We've already done the seven seals, already done the seven trumpets in between the sixth and seventh bowl. All of a sudden there's this inner interruption, this interjection of red letters where Jesus says, you know, look, or behold, I'm coming soon. And he says, and blessed are those that are fully clothed, that actually have all of their clothes on and aren't found shamefully naked. Well, when you go to Revelation 19.8, it says, 19.8 through 10, that the fine linen of the, of the bride stands for the righteous acts of the saints. Because in the book of Revelation, what you're clothed with tells you not just who your allegiance is, but your ethics. The end times is always a clarifying agent for the Christian. It's not to solve every one of the mysteries of the end times is God doesn't give us every detail because we don't need it in order to be faithful in the present. He gives us enough to know this, where we are headed, you are secure. We, Jesus has already won the battle on the cross. Your job is to press into that in the present. But I'm going to pull back the veil at times to let you know, like a view of heaven. Kind of the danger of the view of heaven is sometimes in the present, we, we actually become more obsessed with or worship the place than we do the person. But God pulls back the veil of heaven to let us know, A, you can sacrifice everything and the tender father will take care of you for eternity. Therefore, in light of this, how ought you to live? So eschatology or the study of end times, instead of predicting the future, it actually should curate how we are functioning or acting in the present. Well, thank you for that and for coming on the show and all of these really helpful uh, discussions. Uh, as just sort of a closing, where can our listeners find more resources on your work regarding Revelation, the rapture, mm -hmm. eschatology? Yeah, no. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you all for having me. This was more delightful than uh, other podcasts I've been on, so I definitely appreciate the uh, lively conversation. Um, yeah, I, I actually have a website. If you just Google my name, Shane J. Wood, I, I, all the classes I teach here at Ozark, I put up online audio totally for free. Um, I have revelation series on video on right now media or YouTube. Um, I did just finish a, a book that'll be coming out, um, hopefully the end of this year or beginning of next year with IVP called thinning the veil, uh, which really is, it's all about revelation. What if we read revelation as a revelation of Jesus Christ? Um, so those are some places you can connect. Thanks again for listening to the Spiritually Incorrect Podcast. If you like what you heard, please consider subscribing and leaving us a five-star review. We're an up-and-coming podcast, and every little bit helps. Also consider joining our Patreon page. Patreon sponsors have exclusive access to unaired episodes, different kinds of merchandise, the ability to suggest an episode, and even an hour-long interview with Jonathan and I. Check it out at spirituallyincorrectpodcast.com and see what you're missing out on. Sound effects from zapsplat.com. Special thanks to Jordan Birch, whose song Starry Night provides the intro and outro for this podcast. You can hear more of his music on YouTube or Spotify.